All right, it is Tuesday. It's winter 2021. It's week four. CVPP, here we go. So we left off out talking about, or we just didn't uh, quite start aneurysms. So when it, and we're mainly going to talk about these things. There's the ascending aorta. It's this piece right here. The heart, of course, would be right here. Doesn't look like a very good heart, but aortic arch, thoracic aorta, descending a thoracic aorta, but this is all the descending aorta. This is thoracic aorta. And once it goes through the aortic hiatus, it becomes the abdominal aorta. And you have the renal arteries. We've talked a lot about those, right? About stenosis and turning on the artery system. Common iliacs external iliac, internal iliacs. Once it goes past the inguinal ligament, not inguinal ligament, inguinal ligament, then we have the common femoral artery. Common femoral artery splits into the femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. So in general, an aneurysm is the outpouching of the blood vessel. Almost always occurs in arteries because the pressure is so much higher than that of veins. Occasionally you can get an aneurysm, this outpouching in the heart wall. Rarely occurs in veins. Although we had a cadaver who had one in the deep femoral vein. They can be congenital, you can be born with them, or they can be acquired maybe by an infection or something. And officially to be an aneurysm you have to, the vessel has to be ballooned out by at least 50% compared to normal. And there may or may not be a dissection, and we'll look at that as we go through this thing. In general, it means that the integrity of the vessel wall has been compromised either by a structural weakness, uh, like a having a connective tissue disease like Marfan syndrome or having an area of vessel that's been inflamed by atherosclerosis or infection or autoimmune disease like Burgers. Or Burgers isn't autoimmune. Oh yeah, it is thought to be autoimmune. Uh, and chronic hypertension can, I mean chronic hypertension really sparks atherosclerosis. Those two are related. Could be a penetrating injury where you've had a catheter procedure and they poked a hole in the tunic intima. What's the danger? Well, the danger is it could rupture, right? And the artery's under high pressure. If you rip the lumen, if the lumen communicates with the outside, you get a massive bleed and there goes your blood pressure and you go into hypovolemic shock and can pass away from that. The other danger is of you're going to have a situation where you don't have laminar blood flow and that is a breeding ground for thrombus formation specifically arterial thrombus which is very deadly if a piece of thrombus breaks loose now you got especially if you're talking in the ascending aorta you got up that could get up into the brain right if you know your your highways and if you know your vascular system you know you can get up into the brain through going through the let's say the left common carotid then through the internal carotid artery and now you're um, you're in the circle of willis before you know it some other risk factors we mentioned connective tissue diseases you do need to know the four big ones here marfan syndrome ellos danler syndrome louis steet syndrome neurofibromatosis type one and time to fall down or rabbit hole. The Marfan syndrome rabbit hole. So Marfan syndrome, that's kind of my my standard. I don't like to talk about diseases more rare than Marfan's. It's a rare disease. The, the prevalence of people walking around in the population is about 0.01%. Uh, it is considered an autosomal dominant disorder, which means if it's dominant, the the just one bad gene, either from mom or from dad, is all you need uh, to get this disease. And the connective tissue is very weak, stretchy. 
It also makes bones grow very long. Look at the wingspan on this little human here. This little Marfan's kid. Very, very long arms. And they have long fingers. That's called arachnodactyly. And kind of spider-like long fingers is classic uh, with these people. Arachnodactyly. And it affects different tissues. Uh, it likes the heart, unfortunately. It likes the blood vessel wall. And it does make people susceptible to aneurysm. Also makes, again, the bones grow long and they get very tall. They're also, these p patients are incredibly flexible. We actually had one a couple of years ago that went through the program. They've since graduated, but... Um, she could do this exactly. She could put her thumb right on the back of uh, the back of her hand. So they're very, very flexible. That's kind of an anecdotal test. You shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, if you do, you probably have some connective tissue disease or at least a mixed connective tissue disease. There's all kinds of connective tissue diseases. And didn't we already go down a rabbit hole? Are we going down a double rabbit hole? Uh, so the two most common clinical sequelae of of Marfan syndrome is heart heart valve prolapse, also called insufficiency, valvular insufficiency. That's where the heart valves are so weak and stretchy that they leak blood. Actually, I was going to put that in here, but I just pulled those slides out. And we'll put them in when we talk about the heart. That's why I was going to go down a rabbit hole. We're not really going down the rabbit hole. The other common problem, in addition to valvular insufficiency, is something called ectopic lentus. And that's where you, your lens of your eye can become dislocated. So let's look at that one first. Uh, so this occurs when the lens becomes subluxated. And I don't mean a little bit, I mean way out of place. This is the m most common sequelae of Marfan's syndrome, is this ectopic lentus. Let's take a look at it. So you remember your anatomy of the eye. Actually, I think you get that in seventh quarter. Um, but there's the lens, or there's the cornea. And we have the lens here, which is, of course, focuses light. Normally, you have suspensory ligaments which hold it to the ciliary body, uh, but these are prone in Marfan syndrome to be affected. Fibrillin gene is very important, and the fibrillin protein is very important in this, these suspensory ligaments, and they can break. And then you get this look. So here's a Marfan's patient at the optometrist's office, and he's complaining that he can't see and everything's blurry. And uh, dilated his pupil, and look at his lens. It's been dislocated. So that's ectopic lentus. What's the pathophysiology of Marfan's? It is caused by a missense mutation, and I took a whole bunch of slides out. We went into missense, but you, you guys should know that by now. So I'm not going to go down there and teach you genetics. Uh, but you can YouTube it and find out. I assume you know what a missense mutation is talk just a tiny bit about it but specifically it's a problem with the fibrillin 1 gene uh, and it's a point mutation specifically which results in one wrong amino acid being inserted and that's all it takes to mess up the fibrillin 1 protein and make it weak and, and yep weak and stretchy all right so other other aneurysm risk factors um, having the vascular form the type four of Ellos Danler syndrome that there's different types of Ellos Danlers um, this one is also another gene mutation uh, specifically it's a missense mutation of the Col 3A1 gene which makes a type 3 collagen that is defective and super weak. And blood vessels have a lot of type 3 collagen in their wall, and so you get a defective wall collagen, and you're prone to aneurysm. 
some more risk factors. Basically, these are the the connective tissue. Here's Louis Dietz syndrome, uh, and that is a mutated tumor growth factor beta gene or TG, TGF beta gene, and that's another one that makes important collagen that goes in the blood vessel wall. And if you have a mutation in that tumor growth factor beta gene, you have a messed up wall prone to aneurysm. Tertiary cephalus, it, uh, it was only mentioned in Robbins. I couldn't find it in any of my other books. And then familial thoracic aortic aneurysm syndrome. Um, that's also another TGF beta mutation. Um, and yep, predisposes to aneurysm. What else can increase your chance for an aneurysm trauma? especially from a catheter procedure, like an angioplasty of the heart. Uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, I think we talked about that when we talked about what can turn on the R2A system. But remember, that's a thickening of the tunica media. Uh, vasculitis is uh, inflammation, whether it's an infection, a bug caused inflammation of the tunica intima, or it's an autoimmune attack on the tunica media. That's an inflammation of the vessel, and that after it's healed, that can leave that vessel more susceptible to injury. Um, if it is a bacteria that's causing it, then it gets a special name. It's called a mycotic aneurysm, which is a really weird word. Uh, mycotic means fungus, and the fungus has nothing to do. Fungus is not going to cause an aneurysm. So I don't know why they don't call it a bacteria aneurysm. I guess that would be too easy, but they don't. We'll look at that's a berry aneurysm in the circle of Willis. So we'll be coming back to that. What about some di uh, some non-risk factors? I always put this on the test. And I always tell you right now it's going to be on the test, and yet people still miss it. A lot of people miss it. Half the class missed it last quarter, even though I told you it's going to be on the test. So diabetes is usually just an evil disease. But here is one situation where it's actually protective against aneurysm. Especially uncontrolled diabetes or people who are not very good at taking care of it. The, the high sugar levels in the blood, the hyperglycemia, um, that leads to something called non-enzymatic glycation uh, where the sugar welds adjacent collagen together and it makes the tunica media very stiff, not enzymatic glycation. Sometimes it's just called glycation or gly uh, glycation induced cross-linking. I'm sure Dr. Dumane has talked to you about that. Um, and if you're welding collagen together in the tunica media, you're making it pretty darn strong so it's very unlikely that the blood vessel is going to rupture and or, or create an aneurysm. And so that's the story with that. However, you don't get off the hook that easy if you have diabetes because there is some sequelae of having diabetes. So, and this, on the same topic, that, um, that cross-linking between collagen fibers uh, may be great for making your tunica media stronger, but it also makes it thicker. And with time, it can get so thick, it starts to narrow the lumen of the blood vessel, and you start to get a beaver dam. And then the heart has to push through that beaver dam, uh, which can cause hypertension. If be this beaver dam happens above, upstream from the renal arteries, uh, you get a double hypertension. The heart has to push through uh, the constriction to try to increase perfusion downstream to it but it also will cheat both kidneys out of blood and that can turn on the R2A system and we know that the R2A system raises blood pressure so kind of a double whammy there. Um, hyperglycemia also that's associated what's that mean hyperglycemia? It's high blood sugar. Um, that also damages nerves. You can get glycation uh, and uh, damages the Schwann cells so you can't remyelinate the nerves and um, it can mess up your eyes, you get what's called diabetic neuropathy, 
it can present a sci kind of a weird sciatica-like pain. Now, capillaries with regard to diabetes is a different story. Uh, the capillaries don't have a tunica media, so there's nothing to strengthen a capillary. Um, so the chronic high blood sugar has bad effects on capillaries. It makes them more leaky in different ways. It can shrink the cells a bit and let uh, so the space between the cells is more amenable to the passage of interstitial fluid. And it can also just make the capillaries plain more leaky. And so if the capillaries are leaky, you're going to get an overload of the interstitial fluid. And that's not great to have happen in the eyes or the peripheral nerves when that's going on. Because all those structures have capillaries. And so you can go blind and you can develop peripheral neuropathy, which is horrible pain in the extremities. Back to this bug aneurysm, this mycotic aneurysm. It's also called an infectious aneurysm. And again, mycotic means fungi, so it has nothing to do with it. Terrible term. Uh, but yeah, so the bugs invade the tunica intima. They might stop there. They might get underneath the tunica intima and spark a wicked inflammation. And that inflammation will eventually heal. It'll be over, but you've damaged the blood vessel and weakened it. And so it's now, it's more, e more easily pushed out. So um, it, it's the cause about 6% of the aneurysm pie. So if you have an aneurysm, there's about a 6% chance it's, it came from bacteria or it's usually bacteria. It's a mycotic aneurysm. And again, the weakened vessel can outpouch. And uh, it can break, it can hurt, it can rupture, and you can hemorrhage, and you can die from it. That's possible. It Maybe it bulges into adjacent structures and causes trouble like that. And, yep, could cause a true or a false aneurysm, and even a dissecting aneurysm. So these can progress into the different types of aneurysms. Um, where does this bug come from usually? Well, can come from a cut or wound in the skin. Let the blood right the bug right into the bloodstream. Could come from a surgical wound, a dental procedure, a tissue infection. So, can come from a lot of places. And what's the sequela? Well, it could burst in hemorrhage. We said already, and you could die from it. Uh, the if it's a saccular aneurysm, especially. It's a breeding ground for thrombus, arterial thrombus, and you could get a deadly uh, embolism from the thrombus formation. Or the bugs could actually start to kind of hang out inside the aneurysm, and they can get into such a clump that they can break loose, and you can get a bug ball aneurysm, and if it happens they send any order, it can cause a stroke. Um, so that's called a septic embolism, and that's just a a ball of bugs gets loose and gets stuck somewhere downstream. And then it can compress adjacent structures. We said that already. What are the favorite targets of this mycotic aneurysm? Loves the abdominal aorta and the thoracic aorta. Um, it loves the abdominal visceral arteries like the renal arteries, the mesenteric arteries. Again, if it gets that renal artery, it could cause a downstream ischemia. And you could have hypertension from the R2A system being turned on. Um, it likes the circle of Willis, which we will talk in depth about. I think you've had that in anatomy, but um, could happen in the lower extremities as well. Um, the heart valves, it can, because the, la the blood flow through the heart is not super laminar as it passes through the tricuspid or semilunar valves, the AV valves, it can get stuck there, and it does. Um, especially heart valves, if you've had rheumatic fever as a child, that scars up the heart and makes it easy for bugs to stick later in life. Artificial heart valves, same deal. Bugs can stick to those, conjugate, uh, and weaken uh, the heart to form an aneurysm in it. 
Um, atherosclerotic areas can also do the trick. Old vessel injury can also do the trick. Here is a CT arteriogram, and you can see the ribs here, so we're in the thoracic spine somewhere. You can see lung fields here. Is that lung fields? It looks like lung fields, because there's the ribs. Um, anyway, so there's the aorta, normal size of an aorta. What do you, th what do you make of that? Oh, that's no good, is it? Yeah, so that's a mycotic aneurysm uh, as a result of a bug ball. And we have a false lumen and a real lumen. And, yep, quite a mess. There's a picture up from the side. It's pulsatile, right? We have a blood flows in a pulsatile manner through the aorta. And it can erode the verte vertebral bodies. See how it's scalloping that body right there from erosion? Okay, we're out of that rabbit hole. Uh, what are the risk factors for developing an aneurysm still? Atherosclerosis, hypertension, uh, having a previous bacteremia or vasculitis. We kind of talked about all these connective tissue disease, Marfan's. Uh, what's the treatment? Well, it depends how big it is. Uh, you have to keep an eye on it, obviously. If, if it gets too big, they have to cut it out and replace it with a new pipe. But repeat imaging every 6 to 12 months. If it gets bigger than 5 centimeters, is kind of the magic number, um, then it's time for surgery. If it's a Marfan's, if the patient has Marfan syndrome, uh, the threshold for surgery is lower, about 3 millimeters, uh, and you're going to have surgery for it. And surgery is resect the aneurysm, cut out the aneurysm, and stick a stick a new either patch it or put a new tube in. And those are dark on grafts, they're called. Um, if it's a borderline or it's not hasn't reached five centimeters yet, um, you can monitor it. So that's conservative management. Um, you can do things to reduce the blood pressure, like take beta blockers. Um, and that will reduce the pressure on the pipes. There's three types of aneurysms. There's true faults and dissecting aneurysms we're going to go through. Um, here's the different flavors. And you can come back to that. But we'll, we'll go through these each in depth. So a true aneurysm, there's true and false aneurysms. A true aneurysm means there's no defect in the wall. It's just a weakened area. And it's ballooning out. See how this, this artery is ballooning out? If there is a rip in the wall like that, that's called a false aneurysm. Um, false aneurysms may lead to a dissecting aneurysm where the blood rips longitudinally down the aorta, usually within the substance of the tunica media. Um, but yeah, these are the two true types of aneurysms, the saccular aneurysm and the fusiform, but we'll talk about that. All right, so that's the deal with true aneurysms. There's two types again, saccular and fusiform. Saccular is a sac that forms. So you have one focal area of weakness, and the blood has pushed this out and pushed it out further and further and further. Uh, until you got this little little berry hanging out here, or little fruit, and that's a saccular aneurysm. These things are just not good. You can imagine the blood flow through that is terrible. So this is a uh, a embolus producing factory right here, very dangerous. Uh, breeding ground for thrombus formation, and you can get a dangerous arterial embolism released from those things. And it can get stuck and cause some serious problems like a stroke, myocardial infarction. It can ruin the kidneys. It can make the kidneys R2A system run. It damages the spleen, the liver, the stomach, all sorts of problems. Fusiform aneurysm is another true aneurysm, but the entire wall is bulging out in kind of a symmetrical manner. There's no sac sticking out like this. 
it's just a general bulging of the entire aorta. This is the most common type of true aneurysm, by the way. And remember, there no, is no rupture. The tunica media is intact. These typically involve longer segments of the artery compared to saccular. Uh, the entire abdominal aorta could even be infected in some cases. So they can reach up to 20 centimeters in size. Uh, they can be really, really big. Uh, could involve the, the aortic arch, the ascending aorta, and we'll look at the Stanford ones in not too long. False aneurysms are not weak spots. They're flat out ruptures in the tunica media. Sometimes they're called pseudo aneurysms because they're not, I mean, an aneurysm is a weakness of the blood vessel wall and it starts getting pushed out. Now these are rips and the rips are caused either iatrogenically by a scalpel injury or a catheter injury or you're in a car accident and you hit your chest on the steering wheel really hard had like a concussion type injury um, you can also they can also be caused by an infection a mycotic aneurysm uh, where you got as we've already discussed you get a vasculitis and it eats uh, it weakens the blood vessel so the pressure just bulges it right out uh, the false ones are very dangerous because they could rip all the way through the tunic adventitia and you could die really quick if you pop one of these big arteries. The pressure is high enough that you can bleed out really fast. And then the other sequelae, if it does heal, um, then laminar blood flow isn't the greatest, and you can develop you can develop aneurysms there. Uh, bleed or rip. What's, what's the story here? Well, l again, luminal blood will get through the tunic intima tear, and it can either rip right through the tunica media, right through the tunic adventitia, and cause a hemorrhage. You could die from that. Uh, but it can also hit the, the, it can go through the tunica intima, through the tunica media, and then hit that, that, uh, that extra layer that, uh, what is that called? My brain just went blank on me. That laminae, the internal, la the external elastic laminae. Remember, it's, the arteries have an extra layer. Um, and so maybe it's strong enough to stop it from ripping that way, but instead it rips downwards. And that's a dissecting aneurysm. Uh, those are no good. These false aneurysms are the ones that can be palpable. We'll actually teach you how to do that in lab. And if you are worried about an ultrasound, you can get a simple ultrasound. Or if you're worried about an aneurysm, get a simple ultrasound. And the sensitivity is 97%. So it has a very low false positive rate. So snout, rule it out. If, In other words, if it's negative, it's really negative. So that's good. All right, and that's just a, how we're going to be pushing our fingers down, trying to trap the uh, the abdominal aorta would be running right like this. And we're trying to trap it between our fingers so we can feel it. Okay, dissecting aneurysms. We've explained them a little bit already. Um, but that's a that occurs when the blood gets through the tunic intima. About 95% of the time it's a rip in the tunic intima. Blood hits the tunica media, and it can't go all the way through the tunica media. But because of the pressure, it rips itself longitudinally downward. So 95% of the time. And, yep, the pressure builds up and builds up. So the blood finds it easier to rip itself down the tunica media than get through that external elastic lamina, that extra, those extra layers. And picture's best, so... Ascending aorta, aortic arch is from here to here. Descending aorta, and here we have a rip. Maybe they had an infection long ago, and whatever reason, we ripped the tunica intima, and instead of ripping all the way out and bleeding, it found it easier to go in the substance of the tunica media, and it went down and down and down like that. 
This, by the way, is called the false lumen. This is called the true lumen. And the bigger the false lumen get, gets, the more narrow the true lumen becomes. Okay, there's the false lumen again. And here's just another CT axial view of a patient with a dissecting aneurysm. You can see the true lumen and you can see the false lumen right here. And there's the wall between them. And you can see it has resulted in a little bit of stenosis. Probably not clinically significant in this case. I should probably take a drink of water. My throat's having a tough time this quarter. Uh, why is my throat having a tough time? GERD. Got my vocal cords ripped up from acid. Takes forever for them to heal. Anyway, uh, so clinical findings of, what are we talking about? We're talking about a dissecting aneurysm. What are some of the clinical findings? Oh, this is a um, false lumen type induced stenosis. So if you get a beaver dam, let's say in the abdominal aorta, what are the symptoms of that? Well, you have your downstream pulses will be terrible. You might even have downstream ischemia and start getting some skin change, some ulcers. Uh, upstream, the pressure tends to be greater because of the beaver dam effect. And so the upstream pulses may be more pronounced. If you have this dissecting aneurysm in the, in the abdominal aorta, um, you could, the, f the false lumen could get so big that it causes a significant beaver dam where you don't have good blood flow to your feet. And therefore, your ankle brachial index will be positive, less than 0.9. Remember, we talked about that. And, um, yeah, if it happens above the level of the kidneys, we can get an R2A-induced hypertension. Thrombus formation, yeah. So, these false lumens are highly thrombogenic especially before something called double barreling occurs. What does that mean, double barreling? Well, we'll show you a picture here in a second. Um, but when double barreling occurs, it can be very dangerous uh, because that occurs when the false lumen rips its way back into the true lumen and causes basically a double barrel. So you reestablish kind of a normal flow. So let's look at what that looks like. So here's our picture again. So we had a dissecting aneurysm working its way down and it's got blood clots and by the way that is the correct word a blood clot um, because we're outside of the lumen but the pressure will finally get so great that it pops back into the lumen so the blood goes into the wall of the vessel and it ripped back into the lumen so that's called a double barrel and that happens quite often but you can see all these blood clots were released and bombs away. Who knows where they're going to go? They could get stuck in the celiac trunk. And there goes your stomach and your liver and your spleen. Uh, they could get in superior mesenteric artery. I mean, they could go anywhere. Uh, much worse than it's if it's here, though, right? If you get a situation like that and you get an, an aneurysm or you get an arterial emboli or embolus here, it could go up the brachiocephalic trunk, right? And then it could get into this common uh, carotid artery, and it could go into the internal carotid artery, and now it's in the circle of Willis, and you got yourself a stroke. There's just a picture of the intramural hematoma that is formed, and the pressure was so great it finally broke loose, and a piece double-barreled right back into the main the main flow of things. Where's the favorite place to occur? Uh, where, well, where the pressure is highest is where these things, these dissections like to occur. And where would that be? Well, the root of the aorta, the ascending aorta is the most common place for these to occur. Uh, but anywhere from the root of the aorta to the proximal one-third of the descending aorta uh, has higher pressure. And so anywhere in there, but usually it's in the ascending aorta and that ain't good. So he said 95% of the time, it's from a tunica media rupture. 
Uh, but 5% of the time, it could be from the vasorum. Remember, we talked about those. Um, you can get a little aneurysm in the small branches of the vasovasorum. Remember, those are the vessels that supply the artery wall, the outer artery wall with food. And it can rip, and it can rip itself down like that. So that's another cause of a dissecting aneurysm. And these, the pressure's not as high as these, uh, so they don't tend to double barrel. Uh, but they can get really big and cause stenosis of the affected vessel. Okay, so the false lumen usually gets an intramural hematoma, doesn't double barrel, and uh, progressively causes a downstream ischemia. Dissection risk factors. Well, anything that weakens the blood vessel wall, just like the same risk factors we've already talked about for a regular aneurysm. So the 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 four amigos, Marfan's, Luis Dietzel, Stanler's, Norfibromatosis one, definitely increases the chance. Blunt trust trauma again, hitting your chest and the steering wheel, can damage blood vessels or iatrogenic wall injuries from catheter procedures or surgery procedures. Um, history of smoking and hypertension are both associated with it, and a previous infection like a vasculitis is also associated with it. There's two demographics of people affected by dissecting aneurysms. There's men over the age of 50, and these men, about 80% of the cases, they have a huge risk factor for this dissection, and that's uncontrolled hypertension. But there also, the younger crowd tends to develop these as well. But these are the ones who are affected with the connected fishy disorders, like our fans. Okay, so the old crowd over the age of 50 are a risk, are a target for these, and so is the younger crowd. Ascending the aorta, we said 65%. Oh, we didn't say this, we're saying it now. That counts for about 65% of dissecting aneurysms. Uh, and that's the most common, and it's the worst spot to get it because you're upstream from a, a vessel route into the brain, namely the brachiocephalic trunk to the common carotid on the right, and the left common carotid is number two off the arch, right? So, good chance of stroke if double barreling occurs there. Um, and then, if it's if it happens in your ascending aorta, the dissection can go back toward the heart and damage that aortic valve, and now you got yourself aortic regurgitation. And because the root of the aorta is covered by the pericardium, which we'll look at when we get to the heart, you could potentially bleed into the pericardial cavity and that can squish your heart and that's called cardiac tamponade you're going to have to know that word and there's the parts we kind of talked about this but um, why did i put this oh i wanted to show you an aka for the brachiocephalic trunk some people call it the anominate artery some authors so that's another aka for that Other locations, so yeah, it can occur in the descending, about 20% of the time descending thoracic, 10% of the time in the aortic arch, 5% of the time in the abdominal aorta. And yeah, if it ruptures, you're going to squirt blood out like crazy and uh, go into hop hypovolemic shock. What's the gold standard for making the diagnosis? The gold standard is CT tomography. Uh, with contrast and you can order a 3d reconstructed view and that is just you can't escape the the specificity and sensitivity is super high with that test MRI is good even ultrasound is good but uh, if you had to pick one it'd be CT a computer tomography CT scan with contrast what about morbidity, mortality? It depends on where it happens in the aorta. Um, the dissections that are in the ascending aorta are the most ch highest chance of mortality and uh, morbidity. That's a bad place to have it, and that's the most common because that's where the pressure is the highest. 
All right, that'll do it. See you in the next one.